Maybe to briefly introduce myself, I'm going to be moderating this event. I'm Nicole Nickerson. I'm the co-president of the Zurich section uh, of the New European Movement Switzerland. And um, I have the honor of uh, introducing you to this very interesting topic tonight and to our um, distinguished guests, which we have here. And um, you all know this topic is uh, where do we go from here? EU relations in Switzerland and in the United Kingdom. Um, as we all know, Brexit has finally happened after about four years of very intense and painful drama. Um, the UK exited the EU in January 2020, and now after this transitional period until December 2020, the effects have finally become definitive. Um, and Switzerland is still in this ever-turning wheel of how its relationship with the EU will further develop. And um, will we take a step back or a step forward? Will we sign this much debated institutional agreement? And for tonight, um, we will be discussing how these two states positions differ or perhaps how they might mirror each other. Um, for this, we have two distinguished guests with us here tonight. Um, firstly, we have Professor Christa Tobler, who is professor for European law at the University of Basel in Leiden. And Professor Tobler, um, you have extens extensively commented on questions of European law in the Swiss media, and you're particularly interested in Brexit and the institutional agreements, so or you're an expert in this topic, and we're very happy that you're here with us tonight. And um, secondly, we have Dennis McShane, who was the British Minister for Europe from 2002 to 2005, I believe, and who wrote several books about the Brexit referendum, in 2014, you even wrote a book entitled Brexit, How Britain Will Leave Europe, um, thus predicting what would happen in the future. So um, I'm very interested to hear what you two have to say to us tonight. And I'm very pleased that both of you are here. And um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, maybe before we begin, just something quickly about the question modus. Um, we're gonna try it this way that you know in Zoom, we all have this chat function. Um, right, so you can see that there's already a message uh, in here. You have this chat function on Zoom, and we would do it this way, that if you have any of you listeners have a question, you can write your name in the chat, and that will be our roll call list, and then I'll call on you um, when it's your turn to ask a question. Now, if you don't want to pose the question with your camera, camera and your microphone, if this makes you uncomfortable, um, you can also post your question in the chat, but I think it would be nice to have you um, ask it over microphone if we want, just so we have a bit of a debate that we can have with our guests. Um, yeah, okay, so that was all the introductory remarks. So um, we will now first um, hear on the positions of Switzerland and the UK respectively before we move on to our debate. So. Um, Mr. McShane, thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you. Well, vielen Dank, Nicole. Ich kann ein bisschen. Si on parle français, je suis chez moi. Mais Schweizerdeutsch, it's a bit difficult, a bit difficult. So I'll stick with English if I can, but please put any points in German to me. Um, I'm sorry, Nicole, you're wrong. Brexit is not over in England. It is only just beginning. This is my new book from last year called Brexit Eternity. I invented the word Brexit in 2012. It spread around. It was taken from Grexit, the idea of Greece leaving the Euro. And now my new addition to the English Wirtschaft, Wirtschaft, Wirtschaft book is Brexit Eternity. It's going to last just as long as your Swiss exit is lasting since 1993. And I actually think there's a lot in common that we need to uh, discuss. Certainly as far as Britain is concerned, we are entering terra incognita. No one had a plan for Brexit. I don't want to go over the old, old debates, uh, though they are important. What was promised in 2016, Boris Johnson said, vote leave and you will stay in the single market. You will stay in the customs union. You will be able to live, work and settle in Europe. I never accuse any politician of being a liar. I was a politician myself for a long, many, many years. I'm still very political. But 
the whole approach was it'll be an easy decision, a painless decision. We'll just have a little bit more control over all these foreigners coming into the country and we'll have a bit more sovereignty, but if nothing dramatic will happen. We don't know now. Now, the most important point on the economic front is it's all mixed in with the pandemic, like all of us. Britain actually last year recorded its single lowest growth in 300 years. I don't know if there was a sort of Wirtschaft Abteil of Oxford Universitats in the year 1700, but somebody's been counting economic data and uh, we have a very, very poor uh, record at, at the moment. Today in the Financial Times, they quote the United Kingdom's Institute of Procurement and Supply saying that 58% of businesses are reporting longer days bringing any delays bringing anything in from Europe. I have a friend uh, in, uh, who lives in, in Greece, in Kimi, on the island of Evia, and Vincent said he ordered a, you know, a 15 euro book from Amazon UK. And the message came after three or four days, Amazon cannot supply this because the cost of shipping under new Brexit rules is just too high. It's more, much more expensive than the value of the book. I was talking today to um, a fishmonger friend of mine, a man who sells fish. And he says the oyster industry has been killed in England because you could only send oysters throughout the European Union if they are properly processed and uh, nobody in Britain made any preparations. They just thought, they believed what was said, there wouldn't be any dramatic change. And the European officials are saying, no, you, you, you can't, we can't accept that. I mean, all of us know oysters are very sensitive. I love oysters, but you know, I have eaten one or two bad ones and spat them out and you don't play games with shellfish. And there are many, many other uh, e e examples of this. As he's describing to me, you have one or two big lorry firms, uh, NKV firms, that move fish around uh, Britain and then into Europe. And what they used to do until December the 31st, they'd fill up their lorry, like when the supermarket delivers things to your house, with sort of 30 or 40 different pallets, big boxes, each with a different destination in northern France. Very easy. You took the, ch the channel tunnel, you took the ferry boat, you arrived, you delivered all your pallets, you came back home with something else. Now each one of those pallets has to have its own customs declaration form. And they're just not able to fill all this uh, material in. The paperwork is just killing and doing a lot of damage to small businesses. It's also doing damage to big businesses. We don't know whether our car industry, which came to Britain in the, from Japan and then a bit from India in the 1980s under the great Margaret Thatcher liberalization economic project, and she drove forward the single market, as you know. So Nissan and Honda and Toyota and Jaguar, which now belongs to Indian companies, and uh, Morris uh, Minis, which belongs to BMW, they opened up in England or kept producing in England to sell into Europe. We don't quite know if that's going to be easily done. Airbus has just announced, obviously, a huge loss last year because none of us are flying in planes, so the airline companies are buying planes. And the wings of Airbus are made in Britain. What happens when the German, French, Spanish board of Airbus decides it has to rationalise costs? Does it keep producing in Britain. Airbus has to send 80,000 technical teams every year from one factory, one tech engineering part of Airbus to another, to Germany, to Spain, to Italy, to England, to solve problems. But now all these men and women have to apply for a special work permit. They can't just jump on a plane uh, in, in Toulouse, uh, arrive <coughs> in Wales and sort out the problem. They have to have permission to come in. They have to get a stamp in their passport. And all of these problems are not really, we don't know how they're gonna work out yet because we've been completely and utterly uh, buried under the uh, 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 pandemic. 
And there is some differences, uh, some similarities with Switzerland, but not many, because I mean, for heaven's sake, I, I went to, I worked in, out of Geneva. I lived in Switzerland, worked in Switzerland for 15 years. I mean, Switzerland through its history, culture, language, economic activity has always been an integral part of Europe, very much of central Europe, I would argue. And Britain is completely different. Uh, we still are so nostalgic for our empire. We still believe we single-handedly won the Second World War. Nobody ever mentions the Russians who were killed or the Americans who died or the French resistance and others. Britain won the Second World War and nobody else did. And so that nostalgia is so powerful. We still think we're a world power. And as you know, uh, you drive out of uh, Basel or out of Geneva or you go into France, you go to Germany, you go into Italy. There are big frontier installations just on the big, the main roads. They're not checked all the time, but they're, they're there. Sometimes they're checked. Now, if you had anything like a border control post in Northern Ireland on the old partition border dating from 1921, even just a small concrete hut and uh, one or two police officers and one or two uh, Zolbert Empton, that would immediately be attacked by uh, Republican nationalists and blown up. That is why there was an insistence that there could be no physical border in the island of Ireland. But the World Trade Organization mandates that if you have two countries with different customs, union membership and regulations, as is the case between Switzerland and, and the EU and Britain and the EU, there must be some checks. But many of them can be done in the factories before, they can be waved through, fine. But there must be some check. It's, it's, it's impossible, it's politically impossible in Ireland. And so that means Boris Johnson to win his election to show he was different from Theresa May, agreed with Michel Barnier that uh, the um, uh, whole of the island of Ireland would come under <coughs> a regime for economic and trade and commercial activity that would be under the rules of Brussels. So if I give you a Swiss example, I mean, it is it's like saying, uh, Canton Jura uh, is it has to obey EU rules for commerce and trade. And the people in Northern Ireland who are very hostile to Europe, mainly on the unionist Protestant side, are very angry, very bitter, and are threatening to vote down this famous Northern Ireland protocol. Sorry if this is getting a bit technical, but that's the bit of the treaty. I mean, it's it's international. Uh, Rechtsordnung, a treaty that governs this process. So we've got these massive constitutional problems um, that uh, I don't think Switzerland uh, 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 has. Now look at the question of sovereignty. In Switzerland, sagt man, das Volk ist souverän. Le peuple est souverain. N'est-ce pas? N'est-ce pas? Good. That, we don't know what you're talking about. The people who are the people, for Christ's sake? I mean, in Britain, the sovereign is the crown in Parliament. The people? God's sake, you don't have a king and a queen and worry about the people. I mean, that's stupid Republican ideas. You know, we're, we're English. We're completely uh, different. And there's a fascinating exchange in the House of Commons in 1948 between the Labour Foreign Secretary, a man called Ernest Bevan, and Winston Churchill, who two years before had made his famous Zurich speech. And the Labour man, Mr Bevan, Ernest Bevan, is saying Britain can only participate in European construction, but there should be no reference to the surrender of sovereign rights. And Churchill, the imperialist, the conservative, says no, that countries can inquire an enlarged and enriched sovereignty through membership of the European Union. So therefore, Churchill, sovereignty was something to be shared, to be enlarged, to be made stronger by sharing it with other countries. 
for the Labour man at the time, and that remained the Labour position for decades afterwards, no, 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 you mustn't touch British sovereignty by sharing it with everybody. So I leave to you uh, the pleasure of working out this discussion on sovereignty uh, in within the con Confederation, uh, but it must point, it's important to remember the referendum five years ago did not decide Brexit. That was only finally decided when uh, Boris Johnson was made prime minister in the old, confirmed as prime minister in the election of December 2019. Then parliament, only parliament, had the sovereign right to take the decision to fully leave the EU, uh, which it did, and then had a year of negotiations. And then, as you said, Nicole, we come to the 31st um, of December, uh, two months ago. But the negotiations are very interesting because this is the first time in the history of Britain that a trade negotiation has begun, finished, a trade treaty has been signed that reduces trade. I mean, this, this is an unknown concept. This is why I keep saying terra incognita. Normally the idea of trade negotiations is to increase exchange between the two parties. Britain is always very inventive, very creative. We have got a new trade deal in which we seek to reduce trade uh, between the two parties. That's to say the UK and the rest of Europe. Mr. Barnier, a very dear friend of mine, couldn't believe it uh, because the British only asked for a deal dealing with goods and food, what you might call 19th century capitalism, Finnish physical goods in metal, in wood, in plastic, in glass, and food. Uh, the 21st economy, the immaterial capitalism of exchange of data, of money, of services, of architectural goods, of artistic performances, of education, of film, of tourism wasn't going to be part of the treaty and for the Europe EU side it's a one-way bet I mean Europe runs roughly uh, a 20% surplus with us on trade goods and foods and we've agreed that Europe can continue to run this surplus and where we run a service in financial services in artistic creative industry in university education we haven't asked for anything now, I think sooner or later, people will have to uh, start discussing that. Not right now, not in the middle of the pandemic, not in the middle of Mr. Johnson trying to decide what kind of a prime minister he wants to be, but it, it won't go uh, away. And unlike Switzerland, I think, I mean, you have obviously your big fights with uh, the SVP and referendums on freedom of movements and so forth but you know that doesn't challenge the core constitutional arrangements in Switzerland for us it does in Scotland Scotland voted two to one to stay in the European Union Mr Johnson says too bad you have to do what we the English nationalists want you're not important and now the, the Scottish Nationalist Party in Scotland is insisting there'll be big elections to the Scottish Parliament in May. We then have got the right, if we win big, and it looks as if they will, to have a referendum on leaving the United Kingdom. So Her Majesty may see the end of her reign as Queen just of England. Already in Whitehall, they've got working parties on it, uh, preparing for what the technical term is, is being called the former United Kingdom, F-U-K. Try and pronounce it in the German way and you understand what the, what the problems are. Yes, I must, I must shut up. Um, so, constitutional problems in, uh, in Ireland too, I just described, which again are causing havoc inside the six counties. Huge problems for global policy, uh, President Biden came to the Munich Security Conference last week and said, I'm looking forward to working, America is back, I'm looking forward to working with uh, uh, the European Union, with Angela Merkel, Emmanuel Macron, with Rome and Riga. He didn't mention Britain. Mr. Johnson, on the other hand, 
didn't mention the European Union. He can't. He can't mention it. It's a sort of non-existing, unidentified, floating object somewhere off the British coast. But he doesn't want ever to put the words European Union into any of his language uh, right now. And Mr. Biden said we have to stand up against Vladimir Putin, who is seeking to weaken and destroy the European project. Well, if I'm permitted just some partisan politics, Boris Johnson is a personal friend of mine, we get on fine. That's all he's done for 25 years is weaken and damage the European uh, project. So uh, uh, let me, uh, I'll deal with other uh, points in questions. The British political parties are in flux. The Labour Party doesn't want to mention Europe. It has the policy of the three wise monkeys. It sees no Europe, it hears no Europe, it speaks no Europe because it doesn't want to be associated in any way with opposing Brexit because he thinks they think it's in, 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 in um, electorally uh, un, unpopular. So there's a hell of a lot of problems facing Britain now. We're absolutely uh, without a roadmap, a lot of problems coming up. When the pandemic, pray God, is over, you know, by the end of the year, uh, then a lot of these problems will rise up. And I do think there'll be, have to be a lot of debate at the informal level between NEBS and pro-Europeans in Britain. At the governmental level, I used to be chairman of the parliamentary Anglo-Swiss um, parliamentary group. I still go skiing uh, Davos with British and, and Swiss MPs and we discuss these things uh, and uh, find out what the next relationship will be. We're not going to rejoin in a hurry. You know, once you've voted in a referendum, as you know, Switzerland better than others, that takes some time to change. But um, uh, we haven't got the relationship right. Uh, and uh, I think the Swiss problem with the Ravensabkommen question and the English problem with so many more issues to sort out is going to require a lot of good Swiss-British contacts and discussion in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that very um, interesting take. I'm sure we'll have more time to discuss uh, more points during the discussion, but now I'm um, Professor Topler, you have the floor. Many thanks. I will mention uh, three points uh, briefly. I will first take up the key word mentioned by uh, Mr. McShane when he showed us his new book and the title, Brexiternity. I think there we have a commonality because, as we all knew, the Swiss-EU relationship has been one of constant and endless negotiations. And that is not only since 1993, as Mr. McShane said, he of course referred to the new, to the European economic area. But in fact, we have been negotiating since the late 1950s when we had our very first bilateral agreements between the then communities in Switzerland and ever since we have been negotiating. And we will continue to negotiate. This is an unfinished business. But I would like to say this, if you're inside the European Union, you're actually also constantly negotiating, namely within the institutions, because there is constant evolution of the law there as well. So this is not something that is totally special to either the British EU relationship or the Swiss EU relationship. It has just something to do with wherever you have several parties, two or more parties working together. What is perhaps a specialty on the Swiss side, but I think Mr. McShane, you will find that eventually in the UK, it will be the same to some degree. One of our specialties is that we are constantly talking to ourselves. You know, negotiating with the European Union is one thing, but finding out what is your own position what you want to achieve in your relationship with this big and important partner is quite another matter. So Switzerland has been engaged in these internal discussions now also for years and precisely the institutional framework agreement is a very good example. As we all know, a text has been published, a draft text, um, quite a while ago. And since that time, nothing has happened towards the outside until very, very recently. And in this whole time, Switzerland was talking to itself. Civil society engaged in a lively debate, political parties discussed it with each other, and no common line could be found. Even our government, which is, of course, different from yours, Mr. McShane, a multi-party government, has this challenge of finding a common way, a common approach, a common position towards the European Union.
Now, the question had been put to me in advance by the organizers, how can we now compare what is happening in Switzerland with this institutional agreement to what has happened in the United Kingdom, especially the negotiation and conclusion of this trade and cooperation agreement that uh, had been mentioned also a moment ago. Can this be compared in any way? Now, Mr. McShane already said it, the situation is rather different in the sense that we have on the UK side, a former member of the European Union leaving and then redefining its relationship with the European Union. For Switzerland, this is of course wholly different. We are have been building a large body of bilateral or sectoral agreements, as they like to call them in the EU, with the European Union. I said it since the 1950s, and this has grown to a very, very complex body of law. And our institutional agreement is not abolishing this, not reinventing this, it is building on it. It takes a very small number of these agreements that we already have, and it wants to redefine, to modernize the rules of the game, die Spielregeln, as we like to say uh, in German. How do these agreements work? How do these agreements function in terms of changing them, in terms of interpreting them, in terms of taking care of disputes between the parties? Now, the special thing, of course, with our agreements is if we compare with the new trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the European Union, special thing with our agreements is that our agreements are EU law based, meaning a lot of the content of the rights, the freedoms, whatever it provides, you know, in this, in this, uh, this body of law is actually EU law taken into the bilateral or sectoral agreement. And that has consequences for how in particular the European Union sees this system. And the European Union sees Switzerland as a participant in a larger project, which they call the extended internal market. And the internal market, of course, is a concept of inside the European Union. It comprises the 27 member states that we have these days. There is free movement of persons, services, goods, capital, right? There are certain non-member states that in the eyes of the European Union participate in this system to a certain degree through treaties. The European economic area, Europäischer Wirtschaftsraum, is the one that goes to the extreme, so to speak. You know, there is full participation in this internal market. Switzerland, through its web of treaties, participates in the eyes of the European Union to a certain selective degree in this system. But still, it is part of this extended system of the internal market. And that sets it apart fundamentally from what the UK has been doing. The UK has left the UK has opted now for a trade and cooperation agreement with the European Union with so far for the things that have been regulated, you said it, uh, goods essentially, not much more. For those things, there is no EU law in this. Uh, this is an agreement that is based on the rules of the World Trade Organization in a certain sophisticated, more or less uh, manner, but it is not EU law. And there is the big difference when it comes to the institutional framework of this system. Again, in the eyes of the European Union, a system like we have it, where we participate to a certain degree in this internal market, that system requires to some degree the same or similar rules as inside the European Union, including a role for the Court of Justice. However, the agreement concluded with the United Kingdom, since it has absolutely nothing of EU law in it, is a wholly different story, doesn't need that, is a wholly different category. A final issue before I finish, I think the UK will find itself in the same boat of Switzerland also in another respect, uh, not just the Brexiternity that I mentioned, but this agreement that they now have only covers certain issues. Now, you mentioned, for example, the financial services, which are not yet regulated. As long as you don't have an agreement, what the European Union will ask or will require is equivalence, there must be equivalence decisions 
outside treaties in order for the operators of the United Kingdom to be active on the EU internal market. And that we have in Switzerland as well. You know, outside our large framework of bilateral agreements, we have constant equivalence issues. That could be the financial services, stock exchange is a famous keyword in Switzerland, but it also concerns, for example, data protection, where we are now hoping to get uh, an equivalence decision. And these are issues that the UK will find as well uh, challenging, just like we have it. So I, if I summarize, I think there is a commonality in the external negotiations, the constant negotiations. There is a commonality in that even where you don't have agreements, you are still to some extent dependent on your large partner through these equivalence decisions to make your life bearable when it comes to economic exchange. But there is a very fundamental difference between the two when it comes to the model that has been chosen for regulating especially the economic legal relationship. Switzerland, to some degree, inside the EU system, the UK truly outside the EU system. And it remains to be seen for all the parts of this trade and cooperation agreement that are not yet really regulated, how it will look there. There will be a lot of political haggling, but I very much doubt that much EU law will come into it there as well. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, Professor Tobler, for that interesting input. Um, I guess we will now move on to the discussion. Um, I'm going to say it once again for everyone who is listening. Um, if you have a question, I'm going to um, include audience questions fairly soon. So you can just put your name in the chat and then um, I will call on you fairly soon if you have a question to our um, two guests here. Um, yeah, maybe to, to start us off, um, Mr. McShane, I was wondering what were your thoughts on what um, Professor Tobler has said. You yourself outlined how there are a lot of differences sort of in the Swiss and the UK situation, but um, this sort of model difference that has been outlined, what are your thoughts on this? I think that quite soon there will be serious questions posed about trade and uh, co uh, cooperation partnership deal just because of its great limitations. Uh, Michel Barnier offered uh, it's a traditional trade negotiation. You do it line by line, you know, item by item. You do strawberries and oysters and television sets and coffee and Gruyere cheese and so on and negotiate it all very hard. But no, I mean, Britain just said, we will we'll accept all goods and all food. Food actually is very important, but depending on the month of the year, up to 80% of all fresh food in British stores comes in through um, Dover and Calais. And we've never been a big food producing uh, nation. I mean, not, not since the industrial revolution. And so that is sensitive because of uh, sanitary and phytosanitary obligations. Uh, one of the big promises, for example, uh, that uh, has been made is that we'll have a big new trade deal with the United States. Yeah, OK, but the United States doesn't sign, sign trade deals because the senators from the food producing states of America won't agree to anything that doesn't allow their corn, their soya, their cows, their beef, their chickens, whatever, to be on sale in the supermarkets of the country they want to do a trade deal with. But as we know, uh, American food is changed by adding hormones, by adding chemicals, and just the sort of social impossibility of getting that food accepted means there won't be a trade deal with America. So then what? Um, so I think, as I say, until the pandemic's over, all of this is on hold. About 99% of all political and media discussion in Britain, you know, on the BBC, anywhere, is pandemic, 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 pandemic. And a little bit now Scotland, which is Brexit related, but not really on the trade uh, deal. We've got no history of it since 19. Uh, 73, all trade negotiations have been conducted at an EU level, as, as, as you know. We know what how to think about it. 
So I think um, uh, it's going to become tenser and tighter. Uh, for example, uh, on GDPR, um, Britain isn't going to change the European regulations. So Brussels is saying, OK, you could have equivalence, except that if there is um, a quarrel, then the final arbitra, ar arbitration mechanism, is the Court of Justice of the European Union, the ECJ, as we call it in, in, in English, European Court of Justice. That is, is, is unacceptable uh, to many of the supporters of Brexit. So wait for the first case. Wait for Herr Marcus Schilling or Schrelling, I can't remember his name, the guy who did the famous pri privacy case in Germany. Um, jumps to the ECJ and demands the ECJ rules for Britain on what are the limits of, you know, of, of, of privacy. I mean, we all know the debate. And then, boy, oh boy, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, because, you know, the Conservative Party has become, it's not quite the Republican Party as in, in, in the manner of Trump, but it's certainly now utterly infected uh, with the British variant of the uh, SVLP IFD Brexit virus, I mean the anti-European virus. So I, I see difficulty, especially for Mr Johnson, who's always taken, you know, I think, I think he's a pragmatic guy. I don't think he's a horrible right wing or anything, not, not, not at all. But my goodness, his uh, fond de commerce, his stock in trade for 25 years has been Anything Europe does is very bad for Britain. Um, yeah, the thing you just said about sort of a, what the people in, or the supporters of Brexit in the UK would, um, uh, what they would think about sort of um, ECJ decisions and so on, and that this is of course a big problem is also something that we know very well in, in Switzerland, right? You mentioned how it's um, the whole sovereignty question is a big um, debate in the UK and I just wanted to ask this question to um, Professor Tobler because we know this is a huge discussion in Switzerland as well but is um, is the sovereignty discussion really more of a is it that big of a legal issue or is it more sort of blown up politically? Well, you, you put values to it, I want to say, as legal question or a blown up political issue. <laughs> Fair enough, that's true, yeah. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put it that way. I think it's, well, a legal issue not... As a legal issue, I don't think you can pin it down in a formula. You cannot say you must do this, you must do that, and then you have sufficient sovereignty. If you have followed a bit the public discussion on sovereignty in the past weeks, also what was uh, published by a number of people, then you could see also positions who said sovereignty in a modern world means that you find the best position for your country. And that best position may be one where you agree with someone else on something. It may not be the total independence as some people style it. So what you can say, what we see in the present discussion is probably that sovereignty is being made very big as an ideal, as an idea. How much it has to do with reality, this idea, that is where I always put some, some question marks. It seems to me that you have to be realistic and also pragmatic to some extent. And you have to realize that we are a relatively small country, as Mr. McShane said, in Central Europe, Western Europe, in fact, and that we are surrounded by countries that are all of them either part of the European Union or the European Economic Area Agreement. And we are the only ones outside both of these. So to some extent, if we want to deal with our neighbors, we will have to find an arrangement and an arrangement you cannot find by yourself. This is always something that parties have to agree upon with each other. I don't find it very helpful if we on our side then simply take these rather abstract ideas and say, sovereignty must be we totally independent of everyone else. Uh, that is not the modern world. I just simply find it personally very, very, very unrealistic. Uh, I, I, I have to say that. that The whole issue about the foreign judges is a bit a special thing. I remember uh, some time ago I was uh, invited by the House of Lords uh, to come to their Europe committee and talk precisely about this issue. The judges of the Court of Justice and their role in these agreements. And I remember that the uh, 
parliamentarians asked me and said, you know, how could we avoid any sort of role of the Court of Justice in the future agreement between the United Kingdom and the European Union? And I said, for that, there is a very simple recipe. You just must make sure that there is absolutely no EU law in your treaties, and then you also don't need the Court of Justice. You know, that's easily said. But think about what this would mean for Switzerland. If Switzerland were to opt for that kind of, of uh, approach, what it would mean in terms of the, the well-being of the country, the economic uh, possibilities, the trade, it would throw us back to a level that is so far behind what we have now that I personally would think it would be a very bad thing. Um, I see we have a question in the chat from Werner Hoffmann. Um, do you want to read it yourself? Or? No, 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 it's very clear. Thanks, thanks Werner. Uh, good question. The, according to the opinion polls, there isn't a majority anymore for Brexit, but it's not dramatic. It's not dramatic. Um, you know, it's sort of 40... 52, 53% no longer think Brexit is a good idea. I mean, that is not really enough, for example, to risk having a brand new referendum. Uh, so I mean, this, this is a question of Glaubens. It's about faith. People were told, people believe profoundly that the European Community Commission, community and then the European Union was taking certain freedoms, the right to be uh, the, the House of Commons only should settle all the laws of, 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 of Britain. Uh, and therefore this had to be uh, restored. So we don't really yet know. It's anyway, it's not, it's not in the actualité. I mean, nobody is seriously looking at or considering re-voting for any kind of foreseeable future. There'd have to be one, two, elections, new parliaments, a real um, movement. And there's very little evidence from the economic actors in Britain, the, the, the banks, the big firms, that they want to get involved in this. I mean, it's stasis. I actually think Britain, you know, you look at the histories of other countries, uh, not Switzerland at all, but great powers, and then they suddenly lose uh their way forward it doesn't mean to say you know we become a bad country overnight we just become like Habsburg Spain maybe not quite the Ottoman Empire but we simply cease to be as confident and strong as once we we were and so uh and a lot a huge amount depends on how Europe the European Union Evolves. I was asked constantly, I still am asked, not now because the Brexit decision has removed that debate. They, they said, Mr. McShane, Dr. McShane, what, what, what can we do in Europe to make you love us? I said, it's so easy. It's so easy. Uh, just give me 10 years of economic growth at about 3% per year. Do that every year for 10 years and believe me, the British, the nation of shopkeepers, as Napoleon called us, will be back in love with Europe. Um, okay, over to Emmanuel Macron, Angela Merkel, to Mr Draghi in Italy uh, to, to, to do that. Not, nothing, if, 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 every, if people in Britain think Europe is really, really outperforming us, then opinions will change. But the plain fact is, not deliberately, but since the European Union was created in the Maastricht Treaty of 1992, coinciding with the end of communism, when suddenly Europe had to incorporate, you know, frankly, countries with almost third world living standards in some cases, and bring them up to our West European standards. Forgive me if I said, Switzerland was Central Europe. Sometimes when I'm in Zurich, I've got a little bit of impression I'm in Central Europe. Never in Geneva, it's true. Uh, it's West Europe. Uh, and also, at the same time, the post, I mean, the, 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 the post-1945 economic model just was transformed utterly. 
Europe embraced what I call Davos Europe, ultra-liberal Europe, enrichissez-vous Europe. And so, so many of the people in Britain uh, and other countries, I think, just felt that this Europe's got nothing for us. It's okay for people to be to university, the educated people, the clever people, the smart people, but nothing for us. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've got to rethink, and we are always talking about rethinking the economic social model. Biden is, even Boris Johnson is. Let's see if a new Europe emerges that is socially more just mm -hmm. um, and perhaps less obsessively liberalistic. That could make a difference. Can, can I ask, Mr. McShane, when you say, sure. uh, give, us, give us growth and then we will uh, love the European Union. <coughs> Excuse me. If that would now happen, if you would have growth, if you were yeah. to have growth, isn't the risk the same as what we have in Switzerland that people would say, actually, you see, we're outside the Union, we're doing very well. It's not thanks to the Union, it's because we are ourselves, you know. No, it's Chris, forgive me. I meant if, if uh, I'm assuming that... Britain, I mean, Britain all my life never does more than about three or four years of consecutive growth. I mean, it's just something in our nerve endings. We can't do it. Um, I'm talking about people looking with admiration at France, Germany, Italy, Benelux countries and seeing you know, new forms of economic activity, artificial intelligence activity, the new economy coming into shape. And it's impressive. And it's more impressive than uh, people think Britain is producing. In other words, uh, we have to become jealous of European success again. Um, maybe I can, I saw there's the next question, but maybe I can just briefly jump in here with something that would interest me because now we're, um, very much talking about sort of economic growth and um, sort of the market component of it all. But I do think what um, what you said, Mr. McShane, about um, the sort of empire identity in, in Britain is very interesting, this sort of cultural identity issue. And of course, there are, um, there are a lot of differences between um, Switzerland and the UK sort of in that sense that it's very much the UK still has this empire mentality and Switzerland is of course as a country functions differently. But um, I do think sometimes there's similarities in the way Switzerland and the UK sort of approach this idea of cooperating with other nations sort of that um, the British empire of course with um, its history of colonialism is very much um, sort of in this dominant end of the spectrum of like sort of wanting to assert this power and not wanting to sort of be regulated by other forces. And in Switzerland, maybe the other end of the spectrum is more okay, like in colonial times, we like sort of profiting off trade routes, we like profiting off the colonial project, but we don't necessarily want to be a part of um, of the, the power dynamics, we just like, like sitting quietly next to it and being the silent profiteer. And I was just wondering what you two think about these national identities, what they still have to do with the way we perceive the, the, the union today. The most popular television series, Netflix series, everybody's been watching is called The Crown. I don't know if you see it in Switzerland on Netflix. And it is a pure nostalgia trip. There, every day there's a book published on World War II. I mean, there isn't much more history left of World War II, so they just repeat the old history going over it again and again and again. Uh, the project that Mr. Johnson is advancing for Britain internationally is called Global Britain. Uh, that actually was the name of a think tank set up by the president of UKIP in 1997. I don't know if Boris knows that he's stolen the idea. Uh, and indeed, in the Whitehall itself, as a joke, talking about seeking new trade deals with countries outside of Europe, it's called Empire Mark II. Um, and I just think there's a reality check will be needed that these countries aren't you know, that interested uh, in us. I mean, Britain lies 15th in exports per capita in the league table of EU member states, 15th, 1-5. Uh, 
Why aren't we 10th? Why aren't we 5th? There's no EU law that stopped Britain producing goods or services that the rest of the world wanted to buy. I mean, that's down to our own inabilities, our own lack of training and, and investment in, in these areas. We've always hired in geniuses to run banking, geniuses to run our football clubs, um, Germans to marry into the royal family. Uh, so this notion of uh, Britain standing all by itself only for the English is very, very uh, curious. But these, these, are, these are narratives. How do countries come to find narratives? They come in a moment of crisis. General de Gaulle recreated a French narrative in the context of the collapse of in the final collapse of colonial France in Algeria. And that gave him the possibility of, of, of really recreating France. Emmanuel Macron's tried to do it by applying la raison to problems, but uh, la politique a ses raisons que la raison ne connaît point. The, the politics is about emotion, it's about I, I identity. Um, and um, at some stage though, I think, a politics will emerge in Britain because it'll be fashionable. The way you can make your name, it seems to me, it could be the Conservative Party, it could be the Labour Party, is to say this emperor, this anti-European emperor has no clothes. We don't have to go back in, but my God, why can't we be like Norway or a bit more like Switzerland? Not now, not next year, but I think some of these issues will start to, to rise. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, Stephen Evans, uh, most voters probably just want to be left alone. That's that's absolutely right. Except Stephen, when they want to retire to the Dordogne or to a little Chalete or Pisa or the Costas in Spain, and then they're going to find it's very very difficult to do right now. Or they're running a small one shop, almost a hobby shop, selling green products imported from the Netherlands, and suddenly. It costs a lot more money and that shop may not be profitable. So we've just got to wait and see how it works out. The open seas question. Yeah, look, that's a bit of a myth. Britain has always simply been an offshore European island. Uh, it made, it's always made most of its money from Europe, from buying and selling wool and cotton into Flanders by selling coal everywhere in Europe when Britain was the Saudi Arabia of the world, digging up coal and selling it. It's always had lots and lots of imports of European people of different sorts over the generation. It, yeah, okay, we had a big empire for 200 years, but basically most of us are born, live and die uh, within you know, 50 kilometers of where, where, where we were born. And our food in particular always comes from uh, uh, Europe. And that, that's going to become difficult if not, not the food supplies will stop suddenly, become a bit more expensive, there's a bit less access to all the different foods we're, we're used to. Um, we can come back to this point in a moment if you want to, but I want to give Professor Tobler a chance to answer to the questions as well. Yes, I think it's it's quite obvious that the psychology is different between the two countries because the history is different. We, we are aware of the fact that we are a small country, as I said, surrounded by bigger powers, so to speak. The only not big power that we have is Liechtenstein. And uh, you will be aware that the Principality of Liechtenstein has a relationship with us, which is much more dependent than what we have with the European Union. Uh, and we tend to a bit forget about this. And we, we tend to, to think that, yes, we are perhaps small, but you see in this, in this public debate, in the discourse on the EU critical side in particular, the constant uh, adage that you hear is, let's be self-assured if we stand up to the European Union as an equal partner, and then we must get a much better deal. And why should we not have full access to this market without the EU rules? Why should we not have what we want on our terms? 
And there I can only say again that it seems to me that some realism and also some pragmatism is in order here. It is incredible how many myths are being spread in Switzerland at the moment. If you look at organizations like uh, Autonomie Suisse and all the others that have sprung up uh, recently, and if you look at what they claim and what they say, it is so far off the realities even of the legal facts that we have on the table. Uh, these people seem to discuss out in the blue, somewhere in the skies. Uh, sometimes I really think they don't bother to see the facts, how they are at the moment, and then to think what to do with these facts. In, in that sense, uh, as I said, Switzerland is perhaps in a, in a different situation in terms of its psychological starting point, but uh, this problem of seeing the facts and being realistic is probably something we share with other countries as well, just like uh, the UK. Um, I saw there's an, another comment in the chat. Um, Stephen Evans said, I'm not saying either of these reflexes are healthy. I'm just saying they are based on how many people perceive um, English history. Okay, um, thank you for that comment. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment, but I have a follow-up question for Professor Tobler. Um, do you think that maybe it's also sort of a these um, false sort of myths that are being spread, do you think that can also be a linguistic problem? Because um, a lot of the language that has been used in Switzerland with these um, bilateral agreements and, and things sort of, um, of course, has the connotation that these are bilateral treaties, two-sided treaties between two equal partners in that sense, which isn't really the case, right? Because it's one country um, negotiating with like an entire group in institution, the union sort of that has this very different power dynamic. So is maybe this term of bil bilateral agreement also one of the reasons that the situation is not clear a lot of the times in the political debate? Well, it's a Swiss term, you know, the EU much prefers to use the term sectoral agreements because all these agreements are for particular areas uh, only and not encompassing. I'm not sure whether the language is so much uh, of a problem here. I have a feeling sometimes it is that uh, people like to hear what they wish to hear. Uh -huh. They like to believe in what they wish to believe. And in this particular issue, notably this institutional agreement, I think one of the challenges is that it is so complex. It is a technical matter. I mean, I don't mean to sound elitist, but even for lawyers, it is a very technical matter. It is not something easy where you can say, look, it's about this and that, and then easily explain what it is about. It is a whole complex combination of different issues, different agreements. You will, if you really want to understand it, you will constantly have to compare this bilateral law with EU law, with European economic area law, because it's partially also based on that. And you have to compare back and forth. And that is simply too much. You cannot expect that an average person who is constantly, not constantly working in these fields really has fathomed every technical detail. So it's a difficult matter as well. I think that makes things difficult as well. And that is why the temptation is very big to revert to the ideas, the big ideas such as sovereignty, independence, all of this, because these are in comparison easy, you see, seemingly easy. I think that is what shapes also the discussion at the moment. And uh, as, as a person who has devoted quite a bit of time in trying to explain things to the public, I must say there is sometimes a point where I think, will we ever succeed? Will we ever succeed in explaining what this is really about in terms that can be understood? So here we have a challenge that also lies in the matter, the subject matter we are talking about, not just in the language of how we call this relationship, Relationship. It goes much further than that. Let me, Nicole, just very quickly go through three questions that have popped up as far as... Yes, I, I just saw them. Can I just quickly make a comment? I would say, I mean, if there are more questions from the audience, you can, of course, please write them now. But I think we will, because it's already 8 p.m. after these set of questions, we will probably slowly be closing. But yeah, we got one more now. I'm sure we have time for the questions that are yeah. um, entering now. Okay, so yes, um, please go ahead. Right. Uh, young people, I mean, it is extraordinary, the, the difference between uh, age gap. I mean, uh, 
young people, people who live in cities, uh, our immigrant community, what we call BAME, Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic Community, all voted pretty strongly to stay in the European Union. And it, but it was it, old, middle-aged Britain uh, in England, out in the provinces, not in the cities, they finally had a chance to vote and they voted no to immigration, no to foreigners. I mean, they didn't you know, have nostalgia for Second World War or anything. Most of them weren't, probably weren't born. But uh, it is true that uh, uh, with age, you know, each year a generation dies off. So I'm not quite sure if anybody's done the calculation of when the Brexit majority just disappears. Uh, but I think that will emerge. It'll be very interesting to see uh, again, once the pandemic's over, once there's normal travel, and then when kids can't go for a weekend concert somewhere, you know, music festival, they can't go on a on a, what we call a stag party when all the girls and all the boys are about to get married, go off and get drunk somewhere. Uh, they can't go and play golf. They can't just bum around in Europe. When that stops, I think that that will start to cause quite a lot of change of, of mentality. Scotland leaving the UK, no, I don't have a time frame. A huge fight's going on inside the Scottish Nationalist Party. Come back, I'll come back to you after the Scottish election, which will be uh, important. But the mood shift is there. Just as I wrote, well, no, I wasn't 100% certain, but when I wrote in 2014, <coughs> my book, Brexit, how Britain will leave Europe. There's not a lot of good analysis in it, but it's also just my gut feeling. All my friends, all the British political establishment, the diplomats, the ambassadors, the heads of think tanks, the journalists, the foreign ambassadors, they all say they're crazy, Dennis. They're nuts. Don't be stupid. We'll never be that stupid. And I, I just had finger spitz knocking on doors, hearing about immigration, immigration, immigration. And the fact that the Brexit referendum happened in the year of the great Angela Merkel opening to what one million refugees mainly from 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 Syria and other people who came through Syria that was devastating I mean that certainly increased the push for uh, Brexit if that dies down then you know that will change opinions too now um, but Scotland leaving I think there's a chance yes it is a referendum it's a risk but they're so fed up with Southern English superiority, so fed up with being patronized and consented, condescended to, that I think there's a, quite a strong chance, just as the Brits said, let's try Brexit. You know, all the bien pensants say it's a bad idea. Let's try it. Yeah, why not? The Scots may have exactly the same reaction if they get as far as holding uh, a, a, a referendum. Um, it's um, uh, uh, estimate the chance the UK falls back to a situation before joining the EC of being the sick man of Europe. I think there's some danger of that. I mean, there are certain things that could be done, particularly by Mrs. Thatcher, that should have been done earlier, that put Britain back in a much healthier position. I am not sure those automatic levers are there to pull. People will not accept uh, you know, poverty wages, working eight hours a week. Uh, it's already this far, the high court in our country has just said Uber drivers must have Arbeiterrechten. They don't have trade unions. There are no trade unions left in England in the private sector. Uh, but now the courts are saying you must treat these people properly. And a lot of British economic activity has been because of very, very low paid immigrants who have no rights. If that slows down and therefore the economic activity has to change, we don't have any house building programme. We have no formation professionnelle. We've got brilliant universities, but they're full of Chinese students. Will they stay and make Britain rich and strong again? Not sure. Um, uh, da, da, da. Mark Sinner to, well, perhaps uh, Krista should answer that question about um, Switzerland being rather small. Um, and yes, uh, I saw we have um, 
sorry, we have two questions that are still more um, targeted at Switzerland. So, I mean, you can comment. No, well. no, 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 I don't want to take all the... Uh, um, but yes, um, Professor Tobler, perhaps you can um, answer the, the questions that are still yes, open. I think one is uh, about the psychological aspects. Are the Swiss considering themselves primarily as Europeans and therefore in the future sharing a common fate as opposed to other continents. I think Switzerland has always considered itself European in the sense of a geographic Europe. Uh, that is quite clear and that may set it apart from the tradition in the UK. However, what we see at the moment is of course that those in the European Union, when they use the term European, they mean exclusively the European Union. That is of course a, a use of terminology that from a perspective of an outsider is not a very good one, not one that we like, a one that is actually wrong. And in that sense, I don't think we feel very European. Uh, this, this is clear because we, we are not part of that more narrow circle and that has been a very conscious decision and I believe remains a conscious decision for the, the near future. In terms of the economic power of Switzerland, I mean Switzerland is as well known, it's a small country which has a very considerable economic power given its size, very very considerable, but if we compare ourselves with our neighbor, our largest trading partner, then there you have a combined force that is really much, much stronger than ours. So there we do have a certain problem. It's not quite the problem of Liechtenstein, as I tried to indicate before, we are not quite that dependent, but we are much smaller. And that is a reality, which it seems to me, many people find difficult to come to terms with, also psych psychologically speaking. I said it before, there is this tendency of saying, let's stand up and be self-assured. We are somebody. Uh, and this, this kind of attitude, very true. We are somebody. Yes, we have an importance. Yes, we have very impressive, uh, an impressive record in many ways as a country. I'm very proud of Switzerland, for one. But then again, you have to be realistic. There is an environment around you. There is a large trading partner. One does have to find some mode of living with this trading, with this trading partner. And that, I believe, is the challenge that remains uh, for Switzerland at this moment. Well, I, I live long enough in Switzerland. I think I could have become a Swiss citizen. Uh, two of my children were born in Switzerland. I don't know what rights that gives me, um, but it just wasn't relevant. None, none. <laughs> uh, and, and when, uh, and at that time, the 1980s, all the people, my Swiss friends in Geneva were proving that they had a Spanish father, a French, Italian, any kind of uh, father to or mother to give themselves an EU passport to say to their firms and banks, look, I can go and work in EU capitals freely without having to worry about work permits and residence permits. So that psychological thing is going to be interesting when that's taken away from people. Um, huge row at the moment. So Simon Rattle, our most famous uh, uh, conductor of orchestras, He's protested very strongly. He has to take out German citizenship to keep working in Europe. It's crazy. I mean, you know, I think he's married to a German lady, but it's nuts. And so many of our top musicians, our best pop bands, our rock bands, are all protesting about losing automatic access to European music, pop music, classical music. As that sinks in, I think it'll change things. Uh, a, a, a bit. A uh, question on uh, on the Swiss press claim that the British knew what they want from Brussels, the Swiss still do not. I slightly disagree. I mean, if, if that was, uh, I strongly disagree. If that was the case, we wouldn't every week having to send ministers over to Brussels to interpret bits of the trade and partnership cooperation agreement, which you know, people didn't realise it meant you couldn't sell oysters. It didn't, didn't realise it meant that there'd be a border between, economic border between the UK part of Northern Ireland and mainland Great Britain. And they go to Brussels and say, hey, wait, wait. <laughs> what, what, what's this? Why are we doing that? You've got to change this. And the Brussels colleagues are saying, I'm very sorry, you signed up to it. I mean, you negotiated it. So um, I don't think that's what the question meant. The question was not asking about insecurities and open issues. It was rather asking, you know, it was rather posing, saying that it seems like the UK 
knows what it wants. And I do think this is true in the sense that you have a government, a one party government that has set out a certain line as to what it wants to achieve with the European Union. And that is, as we said before, rather different for Switzerland. As I said, we have been talking to ourselves for a long time, even just in order to find out what we want as a government, as a people, as a parliament. And this is an ongoing process. And I do think there you may have a difference in terms of the political system, but where it is easier for you. But if I may interrupt, I mean, let us come back in 20 years time. I mean, you'll still be very young. I'll be very old. I'll be, you know, in a, a Rollstuhl. I mean, but, but I think in 20 years time, you'll find in Britain people saying, why are we still negotiating with Europe? I thought we settled this. But, but this sector and that sector demands attention. The, the musicians, well, well, why, but the banks, what are they asking for? Clearing houses, well, why, why are we going to worry about that? But every economic sector, everybody wants to retire. Uh, the universities who depend enormously on European students, we're removing ourselves from Erasmus. Um, uh, I mean, I, this is a very sensitive part of it, but I mean, a lot of the discussion was Europe's dead. Europe is a corpse. We should unshackle ourselves, de cadenasse from a, from a cadaver, and the future is Asia. Well, yes, uh, but Lord David Frost, who now is the chief uh, spokesman for Boris Johnson on Europe and will represent Britain in negotiations in, in Brussels and uh, defend the politics in the, in the Parliament House, he's a very nice friend of mine. Uh, he was in Edinburgh. He worked for the Scottish Whiskey Federation for a number of years. I saw a lot of him because my son was at Edinburgh University. And David described going. The big thing he was hired for as a foreign office diplomat was to go to India and get lifted the 150% tariff on Scotch whisky, yeah, which d kills Scotch whisky sales in India. So he went with his team and they met the top level Indians and the Indians said, oh, very nice to meet you, Mr. President, because we, we love Scotch whisky. What would you like? Glenfiddich, Alaska, double malt, triple malt. Of course, we've signed, we've signed the agreement already. We really hate this tariff. Look, it's a two-sentence agreement, Mr. Frost. You just cite it here. India agrees to lift the 150% tariff on Scotch whiskey. Clause two, Britain agrees to allow visa-free travel for 1.4 billion Indians to England. No, we want to discuss trade. Oh, we, 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 we like trade. We want to discuss travel. And there's got more and more, I think, the Brits will find that the dream of a wonderful world in other parts of planet Earth are gone. You know, that, that, that world no longer exists. Let, let me... Yeah, let me just say that I, I agree with your former point, obviously, and we said that before, that there will be an ongoing negotiation. You know, even 20 years from now, indeed, your country will find that certain things still have to be negotiated, renegotiated, new developments have occurred. And that is, as we said before, a, a shared fate between Switzerland and the European Union. It is not only that it is an illusion to think that you can have an agreement and it settles everything for all times. That is simply not realistic. Life goes on, things change, so also the rules have to change. So that, that will be a challenge. That is certainly true. Um, thank you very much. Um, I see there's no more questions that came in. So, um, I mean, it's obviously a very interesting, very complex topic with a probably still a number of things we haven't talked about yet, um, just because um, the issue of immigration has been mentioned. That's a whole other area, of course, where we can discuss questions of the soul of Europe about what's happening at the external borders and so on. But I think for now, this was very, um, very interesting uh, to have both of your perspectives on the different country situations and them. Um, yeah, it's, I think also interesting for Switzerland to see that um, the Brexit situation is not necessarily one that one could copy because it seems to be even more difficult in certain degrees than um, our negotiations have already proved to be. So um, yeah, I think this might be a good place to stop. So 
Thank you to everyone. Very who... good. Really good fun. Thank you. And thank you to everybody for listening to me in English. Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, thank you very much for being here and for participating. Thank you for everyone who was listening. But um, thank you very much for um, you, Professor Tobler, and you, Mr. McShane, for being with us here tonight. Of course, if this would have been a live event, this would be the moment where we would present you both with a gift to say thank you. But as this is an online event that will probably be sent to you by mail because we still want to express our thanks um, for you taking this time out of your evening well, tonight. Well, well, Nicole, the first week or two I was in parliament, I was mm -hmm. invited to a Anglo-Swiss you know, association party at the Swiss embassy. Uh, so I said a few words. You know, I'm, I'm very fond of Switzerland. I'm very, very happy my years there and I've got family there. And I said to the ambassador, what a pleasure it was to be drinking again the fine wines of the Valais. Uh, and the next morning at my house arrived 12 bottles of excellent Desolais or nice white wine from the Valais. And I'm trying to work out was that corruption or was that just good Swiss-British friendship? <laughs> I decided to drink the wine and destroy the evidence, and there we are. Right, okay. That was that good to know. <laughs> this is at the best. Okay, goodbye everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, just maybe as a, as a last comment, um, this uh, video will probably be posted on YouTube for everyone who wants to spread it so more people can watch it maybe if you're interested. And as always, if you want to become a member of the New European Movement Switzerland, we'd be very happy. <laughs> and um, yeah, does any of you have a last word maybe that you want, want to add? No, just, just to say that uh, if you will try to send a gift to Mr. McShane, you will might find some uh, practical challenges uh, because uh, <laughs> this is crossing borders without the customs union and uh, that could be uh, not so easy. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, these are the realities of being outside the European Union for these very practical matters. Mm -hmm. That is okay. true, yes. So we will, we will find a way to deal with this. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you and goodbye. For being here and goodbye. Have a nice evening. You're welcome. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.